to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said to the church in Ephesus, I have this against you, that you have lost your first love. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 4. We welcome you today to our study of relighting our passion for Jesus. Are we sometimes like the church in Ephesus where what, that, that flame and that passion for the Lord sometimes goes down a little bit? If so, we hope you'll stay tuned today as we're going to think about how to reignite and relight our passion for serving God. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. As always, we want you to know today's broadcast is brought to you by uh, congregations of the Churches of Christ and individual Christians. Those members of the Lord's Church in your area, they'd love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. Whether that's on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday for Bible study, you will be an honored guest and you will find people there who love God, who are concerned about souls, and who just simply want to do what the Bible says. And so we hope you'll visit the Lord's Church in your area. If you'd like to have a Bible study, know more about salvation, about the church, or whatever the topic may be, there are people there who'd be happy to sit down and discuss the Word of God with you. And friend, as always, we'd love to help you in your journey to know God and His Word better here at The Gospel of Christ. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our material. We have over 500 lessons available all uh, books of the Old Testament, New Testament, a wide variety of topical lessons as well. And we make those available to you free of charge. We've got written material, audio lessons, study questions. It's just a wide library of good Bible study material available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of this lesson or any lesson that we've got available, we'll send that to you as well. Just log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, fill out a media request form. If you need that as a download, we make that available, as well as sending out DVDs and CDs. And friend, won't you check out our app available in the respective app stores. It's a great way on your smartphone in our fast-paced world to keep up and stay in tune with studying the Word of God. Today we're thinking about a subject that I think all of us at times struggle a little bit with, and that is keeping our passion for Jesus where it needs to be. I want you to think about the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. A lot of things commentary, uh, commentary of this congregation. The Lord built them up a lot. I know your works, I know your labor, I know your zeal. Gave them a lot of good compliments. But then in Revelation 2 verse 4, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've lost your first love. What happened at Ephesus? Did they kind of get in a rut? Did they lose their zeal for evangelism? Did they lose their zeal and passion for worship or studying the Word of God? We don't, we don't know all exactly of the details, but we do know this. Their first love waned. They weren't as passionate about something as they should have been. What about my life and what about yours? The same thing can and does happen to us from time to time. Are you as passionate now as you once were about the Lord and His cause? Or are you as excited and as on fire for serving God as maybe you have once been in your life? Or do we need to relight? that passion for God and holy things. Today we're going to talk about if a person's passion is not what it ought to be. We're going to discuss today from Philippians chapter 3. So if you don't have your Bible, make sure you get it and open to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to discuss from Philippians 3 four things a person can do to relight 
their spiritual passion for Jesus. What are those things? Let's look at the text and then we'll notice what those are. Look in Philippians 3 beginning in verse number 12 through 14. Paul says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What does a person, according to Paul here, what does a person need to do to keep his passion for Jesus at a high level. Number one, you've got to have a holy dissatisfaction with self. I'm not saying that you need to beat yourself up, that you need to be down on your... That, that, that's not the idea here. Having a holy dissatisfaction with self means this. Paul said, not that I've already attained. I have not, I am not already perfected. Paul wasn't there yet. He hadn't attained that spiritual place he wanted to be. He was always striving to do more and to be more. You see, this is one of the, one of the greatest servants of God that we know. And Paul could say, I'm not there yet. This is the man who was caught up into the third heaven, as it were, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is the individual who said, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. And yet Paul himself, who went on multiple missionary journeys, who, who did everything he could to give his life to the cause of Christ, said, not that I've already attained. Friend, if our passion is not what it needs to be, we need to have a holy dissatisfaction with self. Here's the problem. The status quo won't work. What everybody else is doing won't work. We don't measure ourselves by ourselves or by other people according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I can never reach a point in, in, in my Christian walk where I can say, I'm as good as everybody. I'm doing more than others. This is where I need to be. No, that's not the idea. Christianity is not where we get to a certain point and we can sit down and say, I'm where I've arrived. Christianity is an ever-moving always pressing forward, always progressing and growing type of lifestyle. 2 Peter 3 verse 18, but grow, that's continual, that's durative in nature. Grow, continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Well, give me a picture of that. Here's the picture. 1 Peter 2 verse 2, as newborn babes, Desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. What's it mean to have a holy dissatisfaction? It is to be in a constant state of growth, like a, like a newborn baby who needs the pure milk of the Word that you can grow. Like a baby who has to have milk to grow and survive and, and flourish. The Word of God is that spiritual food, and I need to have that insatiable desire to follow God and His will. Friend, having a holy dissatisfaction with self means not only that I've got to recognize I'm not there yet, that I can't just try to live according to the status quo, but it means that I've got to be striving to know the Lord more fully and be in a closer relationship with Him every day. The Hebrews writer would say in Hebrews chapter 10, we're to draw near to God. I want to draw closer to God. I want to know the Lord more fully. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. I want to come to better understand His power and His mercy and His grace. I, I want to develop more into the, the rejoicing that I ought to have as a Christian. And so if I'm, going to, if I'm going to really be what God wants me to be, I've got to have a holy dissatisfaction. Don't get caught in a rut. Don't say I've arrived. Don't let your flame grow out. Have a holy dissatisfaction with self. Let me give you some areas that we can continue to improve in. I don't ever want to arrive and think in my mind that I have reached a point where I know my Bible well enough. I know the Word of God. I've got more passages memorized. I study it more than most people. That won't work. 2 Timothy 2.15, study 
continue to study. Until the day I leave this earth, I've got to continue to study to show myself approved unto God. 1 Peter 3.15, be ready always to give an answer. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. Proverbs chapter 15, verses 26 through 28. I don't ever want to think I've arrived in my prayer life. Do you pray like you really ought to? Do any of us pray enough in our lives? Here's what Paul said. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Men ought always to pray and never lose heart. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. I cry unto thee daily, the psalmist said. Don't think we've arrived as it comes to benevolence and doing good. What does the Bible teach a Christian ought to do related to benevolence? Do good unto all men, especially with preference to those of the household of faith. We're to visit, take care of the widows and the orphans in their affliction and keep ourselves unspotted from the world. I don't ever want to think that I have arrived as it comes to my work in the church and my evangelism. Friend, the Bible teaches us be steadfast, immovable, listen to this, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works. Do follow. The point when I'll stop from my work and my labor is when I ought to take my last breath in this life. And let's not think we've been evangelistic enough. Jesus said, go into all the world. Mark 16, 15. We're to proclaim the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. And so, first things first. If I'm going to relight my passion for Jesus, I need to have a holy dissatisfaction with self. Don't think you've arrived. Don't think you're there. Don't think you're it spiritually. Keep saying to yourself, I want to do better. I want to be more. I want to grow closer to God. Then the second thing to do to relight our spiritual passion for Jesus is to have a wholehearted devotion to the Lord. Listen to Philippians 3.13. Paul again repeats the idea about holy dissatisfaction. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, listen to this now, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press on. If I'm, going to, if I'm really going to relight my passion for Jesus, I've got to have that wholehearted devotion. The emphasis here is on one this one thing I do. Part of what causes our passion to go down is that we can get so busy doing so many different things that have you ever been so busy doing so many different things and had so many ping fingers and so many different pies that you couldn't do anything good? I've been that way. You've probably been that way. Paul said, one thing I do. Friend, a wholehearted devotion to the Lord means that it is our number one focus and everything else gets in line behind it. I want you to think about the emphasis on the number one in the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 1, there is, the Lord our God is one God. There's only one God. Mark 10 21, Jesus said to the rich young ruler, one thing you lack. Luke 10 42, Jesus said to Mary and Martha, one thing is needful. John 9 verse 25, the blind man said, This one thing I know, one thing I desire, Psalm 27 verse 4, be of, we're to be of one mind, we're to be of one heart and one soul. Over and over again you hear throughout the Bible that we have to have a single-minded focus and devotion. What are you really here for? I'm not talking about here today watching this. I'm talking about on this earth. Why are you here? What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? When we say have a wholehearted devotion, you've got to think about why you're here. This is my one, one and only one opportunity to prepare to live with God forever. You see, if I have a lack of dissatisfaction with my relationship with God, sometimes it's because I have a lack of devotion. Am I really seeking first the kingdom? Matthew 6, am I really putting first things first? 
Am I really counting the cost? Can I really say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain? Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. You, can't be, you cannot devote yourself to everything that comes along and allow God to come first in your life. And what I mean by that is this. Sometimes we're not very good at saying no. And I'm not saying you've got to say no to everything, but you've got to say this. Get in line for second place to everything because Jesus has got to come first in my life. You can't be devoted to everything and still serve God with a main priority. Mark 12, verse 31, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. A double-minded man, he's unstable in all his ways. You can't be double-minded. You've got to have a wholehearted, one thing I do, single-minded focus in this life. And so, uh, along with having a holy dissatisfaction for self, say to yourself, I'm going to do one thing really, really good. I'm going to make sure that I get to heaven and that I put God in His kingdom first. Everything else can get in line behind that. That's why I'm here. Have a wholehearted devotion to the Lord. Thirdly, if your passion is not being what you want it to be, what God wants it to be, maybe your direction's not right. Do you have an upward direction in life? Look at Philippians 3.13 again. Paul says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind, here it is, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the prize. Do you have that mentality of an upward direction? Reaching forward to those things which are ahead. But what does it mean to have an upward direction? I want to share with you a passage that I think so beautifully illustrates that idea. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 says this, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. He says, do not set your mind on things below, set your mind on things above. If you're raised with Christ, look up, seek the things which are above. What does it mean to have an upward direction? There's my home. That's where I'm going. Philippians 3, 20 and 21, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body into His glorious body. You look where you're going, right? Where are you going? Upward direction. Look up. Revelation 21, verse 4, It is a place where there's no pain, sorrow, death, crying. All the former things have passed away. Romans 8, 18, Paul said, I consider the sufferings of this present world, they're not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Heaven's going to be worth it all. What we face now isn't a drop in the bucket. But you know, to look up, there's something Paul said you've got to do. And this is the hard part. You've got to let go. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Friend, those who live in the past, it's often been said, are doomed to repeat its mistakes. How true that is. If I'm going to have an upward direction, not only do I have to look up, I've got to learn to let go. Listen to me. If you're a child of God, if you've obeyed the gospel, if you have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, been baptized for the remission of your sins, God has forgiven you and God has forgotten it. Hebrews 8 verse 12. God says, I'll be merciful to their sins, their lawless deeds, I'll remember no more. Micah 7, 19, the Bible pictures it this way. God will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. The sea's over 30,000 miles deep in some places, higher than the greatest mountains. If you dropped a penny in the middle of the ocean, what's a chance you could get to the bottom and find that? Very, very slim. That's the idea. All our sins... Let go of it. Listen, Paul said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. If there was ever anybody who needed to learn to look up and let go, it was Paul. He was holding the coats of Stephen when they stoned him. He was dragging men into prison. He was wreaking havoc on the church. He did a lot of harm to the cause of Christ. And yet when he obeyed the gospel, God forgave him. And so you've got to learn to have a, an upward direction. Now, the final thing that we want to mention is this. 
Not only do you have to have a holy dissatisfaction with self and a wholehearted determination and, and an upward direction, you've got to have an inward determination. You've got to want, listen to me, you've got to want it inside more than you want anything else. This is what Paul said in Philippians 3.14. Notice this passage with me. Paul said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That word press in the original language, here's some pictures of how to understand that. It's a really unique word that describes an inward determination of somebody who's going to do whatever it takes, never give up, claw and fight and do whatever they have to do to get there. It was used in a race to describe runners, maybe long distance runners, who when they've run everything they think they can run, when they've hit their second and third win, when their legs and their body is screaming stop, they keep pressing. Even though it hurts to pick up your feet, even though it hurts to run that last mile, even though it's the very last thing you want to do, they do it anyway. It, it described a, a hunter who was tracking his prey, who was maybe crawling through the brush, going through the weeds, dealing with the problems, doing whatever it takes to put food on the table to feed his family. This idea of press is such a, a vigorous, a claw, tooth and nail, never give up, press as hard as you can to make it to the goal. Friend, that describes an inward determination. Do you want it? Do you really want it more than anything else? Do you want it bad enough that you'll do whatever is necessary to get there? Friend, you've got to determine not to let anything get in the way of you serving God. This reminds me of a man who kind of wanted it and probably had some good motives, but he didn't have this inward determination. Let me tell you about that fella. Mark chapter 10, a man comes to Jesus. Great question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, you know the law. Keep the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, honor your father. He said, Lord, I've done that all my life. I've tried to live according to your word. One thing you lack, sell what you have, give to the poor, come follow me, you'll have treasures in heaven. You think, wow, to be with Jesus, Him to tell you what to do, you can live with Him for heaven. Boy, I'd drop a, drop a bucket, we'd want to do that, right? Probably one of the saddest verses in all the Bible. Mark 10, verse 20 and 21. That man went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. He wanted it, but he didn't want it more than anything else. He didn't have that inward determination that no matter what, no matter what it costs me, count the cost, Luke chapter 14, no matter what I have to give up, no matter what I've got to change, no matter what I've got to do differently, regardless of what it takes, I'll do whatever it takes. I've got that inward determination. I'm never, ever going to give up. I think this is the mindset of what Jesus says in Revelation 2 verse 10. The context is pretty severe. Some of you are about to be thrown in prison, Jesus says. You're going to have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. We take that verse to mean, and, and the application implication may be there, live until you draw your last breath faithful to the Lord, and you'll go to heaven. And while that's true, there's more of an immediacy to that verse that required inward determination. You're going to have tribulation. Some of you are going to be thrown in prison for a period of time. You're probably going to die there. Be faithful until that happens, and I'll give you the crown of life. Inward determination. No matter what, I'm never, ever going to give up. Stay true. Do what God wants you to do. So let's come full circle, friend. How's your passion for the Lord? Are you on fire? for Jesus and for God and for His church like you ought to be? Are you still boiling white hot, as it were? Or has that flame gone down? Have you got stuck in a rut? Have you lost your first love? Maybe Christian living. Maybe going to worship. Maybe reaching the lost. Maybe doing what you really know you ought to do and want to do. 
Maybe you've just kind of waned in that and you really are not excited or on fire for it anymore. Here's the four things, according to Paul, you need to do. You've got to have a holy dissatisfaction with self. I've not apprehended. I have not arrived. I'm not where I need to be. I've got to keep growing. Along with that holy dissatisfaction, you've got to have a wholehearted devotion. Get everything else out of the way. Put first things first. One thing I do. And then, of course, you've got to have upward direction. Where are you looking? Maybe the problem is we're looking down here and we're listening to all the noise down here and we're getting caught up in all the problems down here. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Look up, have an inward determina or an upward direction. And then fourthly, you've got to have an inward determination. If I'm going to relight that passion for Jesus, I have got to say to myself, no matter what it takes, no matter how challenging it may be or how easy it may be, I'm going to do it no matter what. I'm going to keep running. I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to keep struggling till I last breath, until I cross that finish line to make sure I live with God. Friend, our hope and prayer today is that this will encourage each of us to have a true passion for God and holy things. If you're not a Christian, you're not a child of God, we urge you today to become one. Do you believe the Bible, Romans 10 verse 17? Do you believe Jesus is the Savior of the world, Matthew 1, 19 through 21? Would you repent of your sin and turn to God, Luke 13, 3? Having confessed Jesus as the Savior, would you do what He said to be baptized? Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Have you been baptized for the remission of your sins? Acts 2.38. And friend, if you are a Christian and maybe you need to make changes, we hope you'll do that today. Let's each be on fire for serving God and have a passion for God and holy things. Join us next time as we study more together. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.